Are you a ham operator new to HF? The stations you talk to are in many different time zones. What time do you put in your log and on the QSL card? The answer is radio time, commonly known as coordinated universal time. Welcome to Ask Dave, episode 24. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG. I recently received a QSL card for a 20 meter contact. When I looked it up in my log, I realized the time he wrote on the card was quite a bit different from what I had in my log. He had used his local time, which of course was different from my local time. Well, you can imagine the confusion if I'm talking to a ham in France and we each write down our local time. So instead of that, on HF, hams use a standard time system that's the same for all stations of the world around. If you use radio time for your logs and QSLs, every other ham is using the same time. So if it's noon, Mountain Daylight Time at my station, it's 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on the East Coast. But for both of us, it's 1800 Zulu radio time. Radio time is coordinated universal time, usually written as UTC. For millennia, people have measured time using the sun. Local noon is designated as the point in time when the sun reaches its highest point in the sky. A close approximation of this is when the sun is due south of the observer's location. You've all seen sundials that can be used to determine local noon. Each city or town used its own observations to determine its own local noon, and the clock in the town hall was set to this time. Everyone measured everything from this time. If you were traveling on foot or horseback from town to town and you were fortunate enough to have a watch, you adjusted it every time you came to a new town. But then something came along to change this. Railroads. The British were the first to approach this problem aggressively. Railroad timetables were difficult to establish because every town had its own time. Further, there were accidents when one train was using a different time than another train. So, after much ado, and I might add against stiff local opposition, the railroads imposed a standard time across the country. Local noon was replaced with noon at the Greenwich Observatory located just outside London. This time was initially distributed throughout the country by highly accurate timepieces carried by railroaders and then later by the telegraph. That way, everyone was in sync. The United States went through a similar problem in the late 1800s. It wasn't until the early 20th century that U.S. time zones were firmly established. Today we have the time zones we're all used to. And by convention, these are an integral number of hours different from local noon at the Greenwich Observatory based on how far west we are from London, given that the Earth rotates 15 degrees every hour. For example, I live about 105 degrees west of Greenwich Observatory, so our local time difference is 105 degrees divided by 15 degrees per hour, or seven hours. So our solar local noon happens seven hours later than local noon in London. With the advent of highly accurate timepieces called chronometers, the astronomers at the Greenwich Observatory noted that the length of each day, defined as from noon to noon, varied a little bit. So they developed what they called the Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT, to average all this out. Tiny adjustments were made to GMT from time to time to keep it in step with the Earth's rotation. So, here was the first radio time, Greenwich Mean Time, or GMT. Given the worldwide telegraph and radio networks, this time was easy to synchronize everywhere, and it served that purpose for many years. With the advent of more modern technology, the tiny variations in the length of the solar day became a problem. 
As it turns out, the Earth's rotation is gradually slowing. So if you define a second as part of a solar day, that second is gradually getting longer. Well, a change to our time base means that our frequency measurements get out of whack over time. So scientists around the world redefine the second in terms of something that never changes, and that is the number of oscillations of the cesium atom. By international agreement, a second is defined as 9,192,631,770 oscillations of a cesium atom rather than 186,400th of a solar day. This atomic time, as it came to be called, does not vary with changes in the solar day. This time is called universal time, or sometimes TAI for International Atomic Time. The acronym comes from the French name. That's all well and good and very useful for us hams in that the frequency we read on our transceivers stays the same around the world and across time. But there is the problem of coordinating that with solar time. So the eggheads came up with the idea that a new time scale would be used. The standard atomic second is used, and then when this coordinated universal time gets more than one second off from mean solar time, a leap second is added to get things back in sync. And so coordinated universal time was born. UTC is slightly different from GMT, given one is atomic time and the other is solar time. But often we hams, who don't keep time down to the microsecond, sometimes call time UTC and sometimes GMT. By the way, it's normal that UTC be expressed using a 24-hour clock. So instead of saying 7 o'clock p.m. Mountain Daylight Time, I would say 0100 UTC, often abbreviated as 0100Z. Usually we pronounce something like 0100Z as 0100 Zulu. 1735Z would be 1735 Zulu. By the way, there's no such thing as UTC Daylight Time. It's just UTC the year around. So where does one get UTC? It's available from the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, on your HF receiver at 2.5, 5, 10, 15, and 20 megahertz from stations WWV and WWVH. At the tone, 22 hours, 45 minutes, coordinated universal time. Or you can get it on the internet from time.gov. And many logging programs show both local time and UTC time. Your computer likely gets its time from NIST over the internet. So here's the bottom line. We use UTC in our HF logs and on QSL cards. Both Logbook of the World and EQSL assume the times are in UTC. There are a couple ways to do this as you make contacts. You can enter local time and then convert later, which can result in errors. Or you can get a clock, such as this one from Walmart, that can provide time in both 12 and 24 hour format. I have mine set to UTC, so I just glance at it at the start and end of a QSO and write the times in my logbook. When you write out a QSL card, the time is the time the conversation began, not ended. Sometimes I'll put both. Given that sometimes I talk with people for a half hour or so, if I put it in my log at the start time and he puts it in his at the stop time, both Logbook of the World and EQSL will not make a match. So record the start time as best you can. One last thing is the matter of the date. This is a chart I prepared 20 years ago for an article in our club newspaper on this same subject. 
In the center is UTC going from 0 to 2359. Time in the U.S. is delayed since the sun rises later here than it does in London. In fact, where I am, on mountain daylight time at 5.59 p.m. local time, it's 23.59 Zulu. What happens one minute later? Well, it becomes 0000, 000, 000, 000 Zulu on the next day. That's right. Although it's a Wednesday evening here, it's Thursday morning UTC. That's why I like this clock, because it gives the date as well as the time, so I can put it in my logbook easily. So, radio time is coordinated universal time. Every ham radio station around the globe uses the same time and date, all referenced back to the original idea of local noon at the Greenwich Observatory. The last Ask Dave episode didn't include a photo of our local Colorado scenery. Viewers noticed the omission. So this week's shot is of Kite Lake, not far from Stony Pass on the Atlantic side of the Continental Divide near the headwaters of the Rio Grande River at the end of a rather difficult road. The view was worth it. There you have it. For each HFQSO, log the UTC start time. Be sure to enter the right date, too. I hope this brief summary has helped you. If you liked this video, please share it with your friends. I urge you to subscribe to my channel so that you can get notification of future videos. I have a tip jar on my YouTube channel page and also on my website at ke0og.net. The whole purpose of this series is to answer your questions about ham radio, especially those of interest to those new to the hobby. You can ask questions by commenting on any of my videos on YouTube, preferably on the one most directly related to your question, or you can pose a question directly at www.ke0og.net slash ask hyphen Dave. Until we next meet, 73.